and, and there's a couple of things about that. One is the Bristol Bay project was started by a very, very unbelievably incredible letter that's filled with lots of legal and technical data um, about uh, are, are from six tribes up in, up in the Bristol Bay watershed. And, uh, and the tribes were very influential in having that enacted for a number of reasons. And to that end, what I'll say is, is uh, I, I'm gonna cheat with my cheat sheet here for a second just to get the right lingo. But under section 404C, the EPA may exercise a veto over the specs of the core or of the state of a site for the dis discharge of a dredge or fill material. The EPA may also prohibit or otherwise restrict the specs of a site under 404C with regard to any existing or potential disposal site and then it talks about before, during, or after the purpose have been finished. But basically when we look at what the mining company wants to do here and, and what they're trying to sell all of us as something that's benign and safe, when you think of the wetlands uh, the streams, the creeks, all of that stuff being filled with waste rock. <coughs> the, the EPA can, can essentially, you know, say BS. Uh, they, can, they can call that BS card out and say we're going to analyze this as to what the true impacts are. We're not going to we're, we're not going to wait around for a, a mining company to try and commandeer what science is and then piecemeal information to us like they do at the step right now. Nah, samples. The EPA can say, we'll take it over. Why don't you guys get out of the way? Well, they probably, I don't know how that would go down, but the EPA essentially takes over the, the, the full authority of, of the mine site area and, and the environmental assessments. What's interesting about uh, that is the fact that it's discretionary authority. And, and why that's interesting is the Bristol Bay project in, in, in Alaska, well, I'll say, Back up a little bit. The section 404 C hurdle that, that's in the that's in the, the consideration of whether or not to put it into play is that we're talking about quote unquote aquatic resources of national interest. Now, when you go to Bristol Bay, and you're looking at a 55 million dollar salmon fishery, and all the salmon, 90 percent of the, the the salmon on the market comes from that watershed. You can easily extrapolate out big picture and go, man, that's a United States issue right there. You know, there's, there's a salmon fishery and everything else, right? National interest, that, that notion of aquatic resource of national interest is met. Uh, I don't think there's many people that would debate that. When, when we push for this, we're going to sit here and we're going to have to paint a picture of, of the little, I guess you'd say, when you think of it in terms of the United States, we're going to have to paint a picture of the better watershed being an, uh, being an aquatic resource of national interest. And, and my take on that, you know, was I, I, I thought, like, long and hard on this, like, well, how are we going to do that? There's a whole story of environmental richness that, that we can start with. Two uh, Class A trout streams and trout and sturgeon and walleye fisheries and all of that stuff. You got 40% of the big superior wetlands sitting there dovetailed into the big lake. And, and I would say those wetlands are essentially a form of dialysis, right? Um, cleansing, filtering, and, and taking. The Iron Range waters don't just stay right there on the lake shore, north shore of Minnesota. Those waters are moving all around, right? And 40% and of the wetlands of Lake Superior has a big filter cleansing system. The Kakaka Sluice Bad River wetlands complex is sitting there waiting to interact with that stuff, right? So the notion that that, that stuff is there, the 40% wetlands, I would say this, that this is something that most people will talk about. As an example, big muskie in the Bad River, um, in the heat of summer, they don't go back out to Lake Superior where the water's cold. They migrate higher up into the watershed, closer to the Pinocchi Mountains, because of the water temperature. It's cooler up there, so they can remain in shallows and still be in nice, cool water rather than cooking in the sun, right? The reason that water is cooler in the upper watershed of the Bad River is because of the unbelievable cold water infusion that is coming off the Pinocchio Hills. That groundwater, surface water, groundwater activity is really complex when you look at the hydrology up there. The fact that groundwater interacts with surface water and actually becomes groundwater again in some cases is, is really 
uh, a complex thing to try and for any hydrologist to, to study. But one of the end results of that is by the time it finally hits a stream where it's coming down into the, the lower lands and up the Lake Superior, it's incredibly cold, you know? And, it, and from a big lake perspective, I go back to the beginning when I was talking about Lake Superior having a fever, that cold water infusion component in the form of, I, don't, I, I can't put my mind around, I just say umpteen trillions, right? Uh, of gallons, I don't know if that'd be a day or an hour or you know what, but let's just say 24 seven, year after year after year after year. That cold water infusion out in Lake Superior has got to be looked at as a resilient, resiliency factor for the big lake. If you start looking at it as a resiliency factor for the big lake, all of a sudden it becomes a national issue because we're eventually the Great Lakes are going to be in everybody's crosshairs for fresh water. No one's going to Vegas or Cali if uh, we start running our water shortages, right? <laughs>